Hi everyone, hold on to your horses and tighten up your britches. Today I have yet another set of shocking stories that are sure to make your head spin. You might even learn the truth about something that makes it impossible for you to sleep tonight. So get yourself comfortable, grab your favorite drink, and cozy up with that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. There's a state park in Illinois that has a whole slew of hidden caves, canyons, and waterfalls. It's a strange place. You wouldn't think to find anything like it in the area, judging by the surrounding deciduous forests and flat, open fields. The park isn't terribly large either, but it's highly trafficked in the summer months. There's a campground and several cabins in the park that are usually rented out many months in advance. This is where I worked as a park ranger for six years. There's also a long tragic history to this park, starting with two warring Native American tribes that lived in the area. I won't get into all of that here, but there have been strange happenings in the park since the very start. A lot of people blame it on Native ghosts who died on the land. And while there may indeed be ghosts here, there is something else here as well. We would get reports from guests about animals damaging their property in the campgrounds and other strange things. Things like tents being unzipped in the middle of the night and things moving around. There was one instance where rocks from a fire pit were placed in a circle around the tent of the guest staying there. Even more confounding was the fact that they had put out the fire late in the evening, so the rocks were undoubtedly extremely hot. The complaints we would get from the cabin guests were that something was knocking on their doors, scraping on their walls, and tapping on the window glass. It was all weird, but mostly harmless stuff, at least harmless in that no one was physically injured. If somebody left anything outside, unsecured though, it could likely be moved. But then it gets really weird. First, I should explain to you a little about the layout of the park. There are several canyons, and most of them are box canyons with no way out. You have to hike in and then turn around and hike out. Most of those canyons have waterfalls of some sort. Depending on the season, the waterfalls can range from a steady supply of water to just a trickle. There are usually stagnant pools of water at the base of the canyons. The waters there are a beautiful bluish green. Gorgeous in photos, but I definitely would not go swimming in them. A few times a year, we would get reports of hikers seeing creatures in these bluish-green pools or hearing a voice telling them to go in. Often, they would report that it was the voice of somebody they knew, but the person wasn't there. It was all super weird stuff. There wasn't a whole lot we could tell them other than to not go in the pools and keep themselves alert. Like I said, it only happened a few times a year, but it did happen year after year. Most of the reports were from the same three locations in the park. One particular summer, it was extremely hot and we didn't have much rainfall. The pools were shrinking, but we were getting higher than normal reports from hikers. None of the reports were incredibly detailed. I think it was because people didn't want us to think that they were crazy. Most of the time, they would just say they saw something strange in the canyon, or on the trail, or hear something strange and let us know that we should probably check it out. After the fifth report that summer, I started doing some digging. I pulled up all the reports for the last 10 years and I marked their location on a map. I don't know why nobody had dug into this before, but I found that the locations were all relatively close to caves. That was the only thing they had in common. There's a pretty extensive cave system throughout the canyons, but I'm not sure if it has been explored in detail or at least it hasn't been mapped out recently. Judging from the map, there was a possibility that the caves could be interconnected, but I wasn't certain. There was one canyon, however, that seemed to have the most action, and right next to it were three large caves. So one day, I made an excuse about needing to head to that area so that I could test my theory. I parked my vehicle at the trailhead, and I hiked in about three miles to the first canyon. There were what looked like fish bones all along the edge of the pool there, at the end of the canyon. Now this was rather strange, I don't think fish would be able to survive in an environment like that, but at least I didn't see any creatures or hear any strange voices. Next I set out on my mission to explore inside the caves. 
I brought a handheld flashlight and a headlamp, and I wrote that I tied to a tree outside the cave so that I wouldn't get lost if the cave had multiple chambers. I headed into the largest cave first. I didn't find anything strange at the entrance, but I quickly realized I had made a huge mistake. I followed the cave for what felt like an eternity, but I'm sure it was only a few minutes. And then I heard something move in the distance, and I shined my light on it. I couldn't see what it was, but it looked like there was a nest of some sort in the cave. It looked like a bird's nest, but it was so large that it could have fit a human. It was lined with fresh leaves and grass, and there were bones scattered around the outside of the nest. There were no animals that I knew of that could make any nests like that. I then pulled on the rope to help me find my way back out, to find that it was slack. I tried to pull the slack out, but it was never ending. And that's when I realized that my rope had either been untied or cut. All of a sudden, the air felt thin and it was hard to breathe. I did my best not to panic and I hurried out of the cave as quickly as I could. And by some miracle, made it outside. I took a quick look around, but I didn't see anything. Yet something out there had released my rope. Sure enough, when I got to the tree where I had tied it, there was nothing there. But something had obviously untied it. I knew I needed to leave. I didn't know what was out there, but I just knew I had to get far away fast. I turned back to give it all one last look, and that's when I saw it. Although only for a moment. It was crouched down near the entrance to the cave just beyond the light. And it looked ghostly. I don't know how else to describe it. It was like a human, but it wasn't a human. It had no hair on its body, and it was so pale that it was nearly pure white, like something that had never seen the sunlight. Its eyes were huge for the size of its head, and I didn't see much of a nose. That's when I turned around, and I ran. I ran continuously for nearly the entire length back to the truck, and I never went to that place alone again. Back in 2008, with the economic turndown, I lost my job. The job I'd had in finance got completely upended. I knew I'd need to reinvent myself, and I even went back to live with my parents in Utah while I figured things out. I ended up going in a completely different direction and enrolling in a police academy. I appreciated being able to move back home for a while, and it was mutually beneficial since I was able to help my mom and dad out a lot around the house while I was in training. They also said it made them feel safer than ever. On my end, the field training that I was taking created an awareness that I had never had before. My parents' house was on a secluded private drive. It's a two-story house with a walkout basement. During the time that this all happened, they had left town for a few weeks to visit my sister in another state. I was taking care of the house and their dog, Henry. He was a collie mix and the most obedient and sweetest dog ever. During that time, I was also studying for the POST, which stands for Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. It requires a written test as a part of the preparation for the officer selection process. It's similar to college entrance exams like the ACT or the SAT. So I've been studying a lot for it and had invited my fellow cadet Nick over so that we could work together one evening. It was getting dark. Henry the dog was in the living room with us and he was sleeping when he suddenly jumped up and he looked out the window, growling. I had never heard him make noises like that before. His hair was up from his neck to the base of his tail. So I looked out the window, but I couldn't see anything. And so I closed the window and the curtain. It was a bit unusual to see Henry acting so strangely. Nick was wondering if he had heard a coyote or something. I went and checked the locks with Henry following me. I knew that the closest neighbors were also out of town. Their house was just on the other side of a few larger trees, so I felt pretty alone up there sometimes. Henry calmed back down and went to lay on the rug, so I calmed down too. I figured if he was relaxed, everything was probably fine. Nick and I were quizzing each other from the practice test when suddenly Henry went crazy again. He was growling and snarling viciously, which was totally out of character for him. I turned out the lights and I looked out the living room window, but I didn't see anything on that side of the house either. I wanted to get a good look out the back of the house, but to do that I would have to go downstairs, but Henry would not follow me. 
so then I decided to go look out from the back deck. It was a high deck that didn't have any stairs off of it, so I figured that I would be safe. I turned off all the lights and the outdoor floodlights so that I could get some night vision. And then I slowly opened the door and I went out on the deck. It was quiet outside. The driveway was empty and the area by the shed was clear. But still, it felt creepy out there. And I had a strong urge to go back inside. But first I made myself go over to the side of the deck to look out in the direction of the neighbor's house. They did have their outdoor lights on, and under their deck I spotted a moving shadow. It looked tall, and at first I thought it was a man standing by the deck support. I crept further out from under the deck and I just gasped. It had to be seven feet tall, and it was no man. It continued to come closer to me, and soon I could see that it was staring right at me as it approached and entered the light of the house next door. All I could focus on was its eyes. It's freaky eyes. I feel nervous even just writing this. It felt like evil was looking at me. It looked grayish. It was naked and pale and gaunt looking. I could see its ribs straining against its skin. Soon it was right below the deck where I was standing and it was crouched down on all fours. I got so creeped out. I had this feeling that if it wanted to, it would be able to spring all the way up onto the deck. It kept looking at me and hissing and clicking, and then it sprinted away into the trees faster than I would have ever believed it could have moved. I ran back into the house, locked the door. I grabbed the dog, yelled at Nick to follow me down the hallway to my dad's study. I locked the door to keep us inside and took two guns out of the gun safe and loaded them. Nick was freaked out because I wasn't saying anything, just loading guns that he didn't even know we had or that I knew how to use. So then I positioned myself and I watched out the window with my loaded pistol while I tried to explain to Nick what I had seen. I couldn't even tell if I was making any sense as I talked. I told Nick to call the precinct and to get somebody out there. He was reluctant because I think he thought I was going crazy, but he did it and the precinct sent a squad car. We stayed locked in that room until the police arrived. By the time they did, Henry had calmed down, so I was really hoping that that thing had gone. The officers came and did a whole sweep of the outside area, even over at the neighbors, and they looked for signs of anything unusual, but didn't find anything. I didn't back down from my story though. That thing was real, and I could tell that it was dangerous. I think they believed me. I mean, I wasn't known as a flaky person, but there wasn't much they could do. This story still freaks me out so much, even though I never did see that thing again. Whatever it was, could be anywhere, and I don't want to meet it alone or unarmed. When was the last time you looked at Mars? A year ago, my answer would have been basically never, but now I look at it almost every day. I can't help myself. Specifically, I'm looking at its moon, Phobos. And then sometime last year, I learned about the monolith on Mars, and if you haven't heard about it, check it out. It's a real thing. In all of the reports I've found, government bodies try to minimize the significance of the monolith. They either describe it as far smaller than it really is, or they describe the perfectly rectangular object as a naturally occurring phenomenon. I know there's nothing natural about it. I've seen the pictures. I've done the math. The structure is over a mile long. How many straight lines have you seen in nature that cover that kind of distance? Around that time, when the monolith was first brought to my attention, I started asking the exact questions that Buzz Aldrin himself asked. Who put it there? And where are they? That's what I was trying to answer. In 1960, the special space advisor to the president suggested that Mars's moon Phobos was actually a satellite launched long ago by an advanced Martian race. Martians might not exist in the capacity that 1980s sci-fi movies once thought, but the monolith does at least suggest that some form of life was modifying the surface of Phobos. I wanted to see what else was changing. I didn't hear about the structures beneath the surface until recently, until after my research got scary. Whatever's lurking below the surface of Phobos, I haven't seen it, but I did see something else, and something saw me too. 
the Phobos images are available to the public. Just look up the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and you'll find them. I wasn't satisfied with those photos, though. Mars was at its most visible last December. I used a Celestron to get the best view possible. I thought, if I couldn't study Phobos for a night, at least I could study the surface of its planet. What I captured was unremarkable. I didn't see little green men waving back at me, if that's what you're expecting to hear. I was disheartened by my discovery, or lack thereof. So that night, as I laid in bed, the house shook. A loud siren pulled me out from underneath my covers, and I thought I was experiencing an earthquake. None of my neighbors felt it, and when it happened again the next night, I knew something was targeting me. At the time, I didn't consider that it was related to Phobos. But then... I found the monolith. I found a replica of it, anyway. On the second night, I discovered that the wooden chairs that completed my dining room set had been broken. They were reassembled on the floor into an upright triangle. I knocked it over in my panic. The house shook again on the third night, and this time the siren was accompanied by a bright red light shining in through my windows. I found my couch standing on end. Another rectangular pillar. Another monolith. I left that time. I wasn't going to stick around to be harassed, especially after my neighbors had denied seeing or feeling anything both times that I asked. I found a hotel and I figured I would be safe. I wasn't. I fell asleep after a few drinks and when I woke up, the room was red and the siren was blaring and I felt like the floor was shaking. That was when I realized that the light and the sound weren't affecting my environment at all. They were only targeting me. Only I could see the red light. Only I could feel the ground quaking. Maybe it was an auditory attack, something to disorient me and cause hallucinations. I've read about that kind of thing in the past. I didn't have time to research it then. When I woke up, there was another pillar. Even though I fell asleep on the bed, I found myself standing with my arms folded over my head and my chin pressed down to my chest. I was the rectangle. I was the monolith. I didn't know who to tell, I went to the hospital, and I was quarantined. I don't suspect that it looked suspicious to anyone besides me. Lockdowns, quarantines, and CDC intervention became pretty commonplace over the last few years. I was put in a private room, and I only spoke with one doctor. He wore a hazmat suit. He injected a milky liquid into my IV, and the next thing I knew, I was awake at home. I don't remember what he asked me, I only remember his face. I don't remember what happened next, either. I only remember being back here. The siren stopped, and the red light stopped, and the monolith went away. But how am I supposed to move on? How am I supposed to forget what happened? I started looking at Phobos again. Whatever was going on, I knew it was connected to that first pillar. The antenna of a satellite, I wondered. Or transmitter of some kind. Did it know when I was watching? Does it know now? I don't think that injection was harmful. Maybe it just made me immune to the sound. No more hallucinations is a good thing, right? If I had any sense, I would go back to living a normal life. I'd be one of my cozy, sane neighbors. Instead, I'm searching, still. I'm here, asking you what you think happened. You've seen the monolith, haven't you? You've looked at a picture of Mars and its moons. Do you ever think they'll come back to me? I was part of something for a short while. I was part of a mystery bigger than our world, and I can't just give that up. I can't give up on answering the questions. If Phobos is a satellite, who put it there? If an advanced alien race really did exist, where in our solar system did they go? Joining the Coast Guard had been one of my dreams ever since I was a teenager. So as soon as high school was over, I enlisted. I was stationed on the North Oregon coast in the Tillamook Bay area. When I think about it, I was so young and energetic back then. I couldn't think of anything I'd rather be doing as a young person, but of course, I enjoyed my downtime too. When we got a weekend off, I liked to explore the area. I wasn't from Oregon, so everything there was new to me. One weekend, a group of us decided to check out a beach that some had never been to. There were four of us that night, two guys and two girls, 
We weren't exactly couples, we were just hanging out. We got to the beach and made a small bonfire, which I'm not even sure if we were allowed to do, and we planned to camp, or really just stay out all night, out near some dunes. It was chilly that night, but the fire felt great. It was kind of an out-of-the-way spot, so we anticipated that we wouldn't see many people, and hopefully, no one at all. That night turned out to be quite dark, too. There were a few houses a little ways off, but they had their lights out, and all you could see were two street lamps in the distance. We'd been sitting out there for hours when the other couple went to get more blankets from the car. It was parked just on the other side of a sand dune, so a bit out of sight. It was probably about three in the morning at the time. I was lying next to the fire on a sleeping bag I had brought when I heard this high-pitched yelping noise that seemed to be getting progressively louder. It turned into this screech that really sounded alarming. We thought it must be an animal, but then it started sounding more human-like. Then the two of us at the fire still jumped up thinking maybe it was our friends back at the car. We sprinted towards them and intercepted them at the sand dune just as they were heading back to us. They had heard the screeching noises too and thought maybe one of us had been hurt. We could still hear the noises coming from the direction of some nearby trees and we debated how smart it would be to check it out. We tried to pinpoint where the screaming was coming from, but it was hard to tell the exact direction. It seemed to be coming from every direction, and the sound of the ocean wasn't helping much either, not to mention the darkness. We made our way back to the campsite once the screeching had stopped, but we didn't use our lights because we didn't want to identify our position. We only got a few yards along when we heard a deep cough. We all stopped. It was impossible to see anything, but we could hear shuffling noises too. We stayed hidden behind some of the brush until we heard what sounded like dragging, as if something heavy was being pulled across the surface of the sand. At this point, my imagination was going wild at what might be happening out in the darkness in front of me. And then we heard a noise again, and at that point, I was getting a strong urge to run. We were about to turn around when all of a sudden, this huge beast appeared between two of the trees. It sure wasn't anything normal. It stood upright and was between seven and eight feet tall. At that point, I went ahead and I turned on my tactical flashlight. I needed to have some idea of what we were dealing with. The thing was covered with reddish-brown hair and it looked to be soaking wet. And it looked like a giant, a Neanderthal or something. We stopped and just stared at it. It had a heavy brow ridge and pronounced lips. It had beady black eyes and was staring toward us even though my light must have been blinding it. It had hold of a large animal too, which I can only think was probably the dragging sound that we heard. From what I could tell, it appeared to be a dead sea lion. Presumably this huge creature had been out in the ocean, hunting? When I shined my light on it, it started bellowing, and at that point we all simultaneously turned around and hightailed it out of there as fast as we could. We all got in the car and drove up the road toward where the few houses and streetlights were, and we just sat there, under the light. We figured that if we were near streetlights, we could see that thing coming if it was inclined to follow us. We were scared crapless, and we just kept throwing out theories as to what in the hell it could have been. Honestly, the closest we could agree on was that it resembled what we imagined a Bigfoot to look like. But all of us had the same thinking. How could that be? Because even though Bigfoot hadn't been proven, we've only ever heard of it in the depths of forests. It seemed crazy to think that we might have spotted one that had been hunting in the ocean. We stayed in the car until sunrise. It was already like four in the morning anyway, so it was only another hour or so. The entire time we kept a lookout for any sign of movement, any sign that it was nearby. And then at the crack of daylight, we headed back to the beach to make sure the fire was out, gather any last items, and continued out of there. I did feel obligated to report it all to my chief petty officer. He asked quite a few questions, and I gave him all the details I could remember. His reaction was fairly low-key, and it was hard for me to tell what he really thought but I figured that I'd done my duty and they could now make their own determination as to if an investigation was necessary. I did keep a close eye on the news for any reports for a while afterward, but nothing ever came up.
So I go to college over in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and last semester I had the most terrifying experience of my life, just outside of one of the frat houses off campus. This is what I saw. You can decide for yourself if you want to believe it or not. It was January, the start of the spring semester, and some friends of mine were throwing this huge party to welcome everyone back. I was having a great time, honestly, for the majority of the night. Something that I noticed early on when I first arrived was that there was garbage scattered everywhere in the front yard. All the trash bags and cans had been toppled over and torn into. Obviously, I assumed that this was because of some animal, but it was actually insane how much trash was scattered about. I mention this because not only was the yard of that frat house trashed, but so were the yards of nearly every other adjacent house on the block. It seemed like whatever was messing with the garbage was hungry. Coming from a rural area myself, we had a lot of times where we had an unwelcome stay from a family of raccoons, or even the occasional bear. But it was never as bad as the way that block looked, so much so that everybody I was with that day commented on it. And then, that was the last I thought of it, until later. A few hours later, around midnight, I went out on the porch for a smoke with my friends. And that's when I noticed that the porch reeked like urine and something else that I couldn't put my finger on. I assumed someone partied too hard and peed on the porch as a joke or something. I don't know. I couldn't think of any other reason other than that. So we are out there for a little while when all of a sudden, we hear a yell coming from the opposite side of the yard, from the front side of the house. It takes me a second to register what the hell is going on, but my friends run back inside and try to see what the fuss is about. So there I am, alone on the porch with no idea about the impending weird stuff that I'm about to witness. I hear a distant conversation, yelling, but I'm not paying too much attention to it. I'm just sort of looking out into the yard, smoking. Then I see it run by. Coming from the front of the house is a creature that is big, massive even, and sprinting fast as hell. In fact, it was so quick that at first I didn't even have the slightest idea what it looked like, only that it was speeding right through the yard, and that it was big, and then it stops. It stops right near the edge of the yard where the forest starts. It sits there for a moment, and even though it's dark, I manage to finally get a decent look at it. It was some kind of a wolf, dog, a combination of both. Just the grossest thing you could imagine sitting there on all fours and frothing at the mouth. I choked. It scared the crap out of me and I just choked on my cigarette with the loudest, most obnoxious cough you've ever heard. Well. Of course, that was a huge mistake. With that, the creature snapped its head towards me, and now we are making eye contact. I thought I was going to die, honestly. My nerves were shot. I just kept hoping that maybe somebody would come back outside and check on me or something. I couldn't move. I wanted to yell, but I knew that if I did, it would probably set the thing off somehow. So I kept quiet. And as I'm looking at it, the freakiest thing happens. This wolf, it gets up and it stands on its hind legs, still staring at me. Now I really think I'm losing my mind because as big as I thought it was before, now the thing is standing at least seven feet in the air. Taller than me, taller than any person I've ever been next to. It was so confusing to look at, really. But I wasn't so messed up that I didn't know what I was seeing. I could tell this was not normal. It had these crazy eyes, like glowing, human eyes on a dog-like head. I told you already about how tall the thing was, but it wasn't just tall, it was also jacked. Its odd, human torso was insanely muscular, which explains how it moved around so quickly, I suppose. I just didn't fully comprehend its anatomy. Even the human parts had fur, and even the animal parts looked vaguely human-shaped. We just sat there for a moment looking at each other. I stood as still as I possibly could, and as boring as that might sound, I think it worked. Eventually, I won the staring match, and that monster thing just sort of became bored, I think. Lost interest in me. It turned around and it ran straight into the woods without so much as a second glance. I'll never forget that thing. 
its eyes, the novelty of it all. I still go to school there in Michigan, so who knows? Maybe I'll run into that thing again. If I do, I'll certainly give you an update and let you know about it. One good thing, though, I think we figured out the mystery behind all that torn up garbage. And it definitely wasn't a family of raccoons. When I lived in Ohio, I had a job working for the sheriff's department. I remember one of my first duties was patrolling a wooded area. From my understanding, it was one of those tasks that nobody wanted, so being young and new, I was given the job. I didn't realize that I was given the grub work until much later in my employment, but hey, it was an interesting experience. As I understood it, the area was known to attract people who were often up to no good, or doing mischievous business. I had come to think of it as a lover's lane type of an area, but as it turned out, it attracted a much different type of mischief. The night in question was one of those nights, very warm, but kind of humid. This wasn't unusual for Ohio, but the days had been so hot that the rain didn't even help. It just made everything sticky. So what felt like eight hours of patrol was actually only two. Time seemed to stand still on this particular night. Maybe it was because I was feeling a little overworked. The week had been especially long. And this specific night happened to be Friday night for me and I just really wanted to get home. Sometimes if the nights were calm, I would park a while and just relax. Basically, stop patrolling. This was one of those nights. It was pretty calm, no disruptions other than the uncomfortable feeling of the heat and the wet air. So I paused patrolling, and I parked. I know it doesn't sound like the most appropriate thing to do when you're on duty, park and just relax, but I kind of just let myself take the time as a little break. But that's when it happened. I was soon contacted on the radio about multiple reports of an unusual green light just up the road from where I was. I thought, of course this would happen. I didn't think anything would come of it, but I hopped into my vehicle and I started circling again, patrolling. I figured the green light might best be explained by kids who came to the woods looking for trouble. I circled and I circled, but I didn't see anything like a green light. And then after about an hour or so, I decided to hop out of the vehicle again. I couldn't stand sitting in there despite the humidity outside. Also, now I was bored and I started just flashing my flashlight around into the trees, thinking maybe I could spot the kids. Maybe they had fireworks. I know this story makes me sound irresponsible or like I wasn't working hard, but I didn't know what else to do to keep myself from falling asleep. I was young. Not that that makes a difference. Anyway, I'm shining my flashlight around, I'm looking at some of the trees, and this all gets boring pretty quickly. So I turned off my flashlight and sat on the hood of my vehicle. I even started to text a few friends when I started to hear something approaching me. I could hear the sound of leaves crunching underfoot, and some cracking as if branches were being broken. I looked up, but I didn't see anything. So I put my phone down and started looking around. It was dark and I was surrounded nearly completely by trees. This excluded the area of the dirt path and the strange little parking area that was basically just a piece of dirt. But I still couldn't see anything. If it had been a person, I think I would have seen them by now. The trees were pretty tall, but the trunks were rather thin. So the dense area of leaves started probably about 12 feet up from the ground. So a person would be noticeable, right? Also, I didn't hear any talking or giggling, and that made it even more bizarre. If it had been kids, they surely would be making noise, usually laughing. But all I heard was this strange movement in the distance. I tried picturing pleasant things because I started to get a little freaked out. I told myself it was just a dog in the woods. That didn't seem too scary. I kept looking toward the trees, and then I noticed that one of the trees appeared to move in a strange way, like it was swaying at the trunk. You know, when you're out in the dark and certain things look much darker than everything else, well, that's what these trees looked like. They looked darker than everything else, like a shadow of themselves, if that makes sense. And then I realized that the tree that moved, 
It no longer looked like a tree. It now looked like a very tall person, as in about nine feet tall. It looked like it had shoulders and arms and a neck and all the things that a human would. I told myself I was hallucinating. The dark can do that to people. It's tricky. But then the shadow moved again, and this time I saw a distinct head. But I didn't see a face, just the shadow of where its head would be. How did I know it was its head, though? Well, I could see eyes. Its eyes were glowing this strange orange color. I was now terrified. What was I to do? What was this thing? I didn't have an answer for these questions. And before I could think, I found myself jumping into the patrol car and speeding off towards town. I started thinking about the reports of the green light and how this strange thing was in the woods. Did both of these incidents stem from each other? Like, did this shadow with orange eyes come from the green light? That wouldn't make much sense, would it? Or maybe it would. I'm not sure what I saw. I'm not sure if it was a creature from outer space or if it was one of those ape monsters that people always talk about. All I know is it scared a lot of life out of me. I was working for the Wisconsin DNR when I was sent out to investigate a wild deer with potential chronic wasting disease. It had been reported on the eastern section of the Ice Age Trail. It's a pretty popular trail in the state, so I was told to find the deer quickly and dispatch of it if it had any signs of CWD. Three different hikers had reported it over the last week, all around the same area. All of the reports said the deer was malnourished, severely injured, and smelled of infection. This description didn't necessarily lead me to believe it was a case of CWD. The more likely cause was an injury that had become gangrene. Either way, the deer likely needed to be humanely dispatched. The section of trail the deer was reported on was difficult to access with a vehicle, so I ended up needing to hike in. The deer was reported to be hanging out near one of the public shelters, with the last sighting being less than a full day ago. If the deer was in as bad a shape as the witnesses claimed, I didn't expect it to have gotten far, even if it was still alive. I reached the shelter just as a storm began to roll in, which was odd. I didn't see any evidence of rain on the weather forecast that morning, but it looked like it was going to get ugly. I looked around quickly for the deer, but the rain started to fall heavily and I decided to wait it out in the shelter. The shelters in this area of the park are more like little cabins. They are used often by backpackers who are through hiking, so it wasn't an unpleasant place to wait out the storm. Just as soon as I took off my backpack and sat down, I was overcome by the stench of rotting flesh. It came out of nowhere, and it was so strong that I was nearly gagging. I looked around the interior of the shelter to see if I could find the source. I thought I saw something move past the doorway. But when I peeked outside, there was nothing but rain. The stench then disappeared as quickly as it had arrived. There was no explanation for it. I tried to eat one of the granola bars I had packed, but I just couldn't find my appetite. The rain was pelting the shelter and spraying in through the open doorway. I tried to check the weather forecast on my phone, but there was no service. I waited in the shelter for maybe another 30 minutes. The storm hadn't let up, but the stench suddenly returned. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew there was something terribly wrong. I can't explain how I knew. I just knew. And then I heard something scrape against the side of the shelter. It was loud, even with the rain outside. I looked out through the window and I saw what looked to be white antlers. Now that didn't make any sense at all. It was early summer here in Wisconsin and bucks don't start growing their antlers until much later in the season. And even if, for some reason, they were early, they would still be covered in felt. I figured this must be the injured deer and it certainly smelled like it was on death's door. I tried to get a better look out the window, but the animal appeared to be moving towards the door of the shelter. Whatever it was, I was about to see it soon enough. I couldn't shake the feeling, though, that there was something off about this whole situation. There was something more to this injured deer. I knew that much, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I had the gun I packed in to dispatch this deer. I pointed it at the door, and I waited. The doorway was dark because of the storm outside, but I could still see well enough to know that the creature that walked into view 
wasn't an old, injured deer. It was about twice the size of a white tail, and its body was absolutely skeletal. I could have counted its ribs even without the rain soaking the beast. Its fur was long and stringy like the kind of long hair you would find on a dog, and parts of it were missing its fur completely. But that's not the worst part. Its head was a skull. No hair, no skin, just bone with the antlers attached. And I didn't see any eyes in its sockets, but like I said, it was dark. I could see it had a tongue in its jaw, and its teeth looked like those of a deer. The lower jaw didn't appear to be hanging on by much. And I don't know what the thing was. I gave it about ten seconds standing there in that dark, rain-soaked doorway before I fired at it. I hit that beast three times center mass, and it ran away. It literally ran away like it had been scared or something. Not like it had just been blasted with a shotgun, because it didn't fall down, and it didn't even falter a step. It just ran. I waited another hour for the storm to pass before hiking out of there. I had never been so scared in my life. If a shotgun couldn't stop it, there was nothing I could do if I ran into it again. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I finally reached my truck. I had no idea what to report to my boss, either. I told him that there was something terribly wrong with the deer, and that it was something I had never seen before. Also that I had shot at it three times and it acted like it was nothing. No one believed me. I ended up leaving that position in six months for a desk job, and I never, never, ever go hiking alone anymore. I know you get a lot of letters from park rangers, and I never thought I would be one of them, but I'm writing this anyway. I don't work in a big national park, but that doesn't mean that I don't have my fair share of adventures. And this story is definitely not the kind of story you tell to family around the dinner table. Like a lot of people who work as park rangers, I love the outdoors. I don't want to be under a roof. I want to be out, hiking, trail clearing, whatever. I work at Henry W. Coe State Park, an 87,000 acre reserve in Northern California. It's a big place full of relatively unspoiled wilderness and gorgeous scenery. We have fishing, hunting, and even equestrian campgrounds if you want to bring your horse. The park is what you would call rugged. In fact, some of the more adventurous hiking loops are steep enough that you need to be in great shape to make it all the way through. Naturally, maintaining the trails is important and checking trail conditions can take a long time. Typically, we do our routine patrols alone, but there are times and places where we go in pairs. Since I've been on the job for a while, I usually have one of the more junior park rangers with me. It's nice because I like showing them some of the spots only a longtime ranger could know. We don't talk about it much, but there are a few places in Henry Co. Park that, well, they have a history. Actually, a lot of the park has a history, but it's not generally known. This is one. The park staff calls it Hangman's Hill, and it's not just a scenic overlook with an interesting name. That title was earned because the tree at the top was used to execute more than one outlaw during California's Wild West days. Since Hangman's Hill is a popular hiking destination, the trail and the area see more use than most. We regularly patrol and check the trail conditions to make sure that they're as safe as possible. I was out on patrol with Oliver, one of the newest park rangers. We were hiking the long loop up to Hangman's Hill. It starts out easy, but the middle section gets steep and rough, and even the best hikers need to take breaks. We did a little trail maintenance along the way, making sure that trash was picked up. It always amazes me that people can't leave the wilderness the way they found it. There were a few places where there were deeper ruts in the dirt, like something had been digging in the trail, but we filled those in. The day was perfect for hiking, clear blue sky, annoyingly bright sunshine, and the weather was a crisp 73 degrees. Oliver and I made good time as we progressed up the trail. We passed a few hikers, but apparently Hangman's Hill wasn't popular that day. That was fine by me. We had been getting some complaints about downed tree limbs up there, and the last thing I wanted to do was deal with the public while I was trying to hack up a giant branch. At the halfway point, when the trail gets steep enough that you're climbing rather than hiking, we took a breather and I casually asked Oliver whether he had been up this trail before. He hadn't. This was always the awkward part of breaking in a new park ranger because it can go one of two ways. 
I can warn them, nothing happens, and they think I'm being a jerk and complain to our supervisor, or they don't believe me and if something does happen, I have to deal with a terrified coworker who complains to our supervisor. So over protein bars, I ask Oliver if he's ever even heard of Hangman's Hill. He said he hasn't. I think, well, this is going to be fun. So I casually mention that the site has a lot of history behind it. Desperados, horse rustlers, claim jumpers, and classic Wild West justice. There was even an infamous pair of brothers who were hanged up there. I don't lay it on too thick, I just tell it like a historical lecture. And I can tell that Oliver is taking it in like classroom information. I don't think that it'll last long, but I guess it depends on the hill. So the hike up to the crest of Hangman's Hill takes another hour. And the minute we get close to the site, I can tell it's going to be a rough visit. The bright sun that's been making me squint even though I'm wearing sunglasses, and my uniform hat is strangely cool and dim. There's a breeze moving through the pines at the perimeter of the hill. The perimeter, not the hilltop itself. The hanging tree is the only thing at the top, and it stands at the center of the hill. Nothing but grass grows around it. No flowers, no scrub, just weedy grass that's so tough it doesn't care about what else is up there. The tree itself is completely bare. Bark beetles got to it decades ago, and a burned-out hollow at the base shows that it's been struck by lightning at least once. Most of the tree limbs are long gone except for one. The one branch that still exists is thick and it juts out far to the right. It's about 12 feet off the ground. Perfect height for a hangman's noose. Going up to Hangman's Hill is never a good time, but there is a job to do. I point out the dead fall and broken branches from the last windstorm in the stand of pine trees, and Oliver and I get to work. I give him credit for keeping his cool, but I also wonder how long it will take before he notices that, aside from the strangely loud sound of our saws, there is no sound at the top of the hill. No birdsong, no wind, not pine branches knocking together in the breeze. The fact that I can feel a breeze, but not hear it, it's a bad sign number two. We finish cutting the deadfall into manageable logs and we stack them off to the side and that's when Oliver really looks at the hanging tree. He asks me why we don't cut it down. It's dead. I'm all set to give him the it's a historical marker talk when the wind we can't hear shifts, blowing right past the tree. I smell the unmistakable, sick, sweet stink of rot and decay even though there isn't anything dead that I can see. All of a sudden, I feel a blast of wind rush up the hilltop, and there's sound again. Men swearing, the deep grunts of neighing of horses, the crack of gunshot bounces all around us, and both of us hit the ground out of a reflex. Oliver's looking around for the shooter. I'm looking at the tree. There's something on it. Or, well, two somethings. Two black, ragged shapes. Heads tilted at unnatural angles, twisting in the wind as they dangle from the thick black rope slung over the single long branch. The wind shifts to bring the stink of whiskey and body odor right into our faces, and there's a huge, horrible feeling of pressure, like we're in the eye of the storm, and the sunlight goes so pale that it might as well not be there. I manage to tell Oliver that we're done, time to head out. I dig into my pack for the emergency bottle of whiskey I carry when I have to come up here, and I roll it toward the hanging tree. Oliver and I slide back over the edge of the hill and we scramble down the slope. We don't talk for a long time. When we get back to the ranger station, I open up my desk drawer for another bottle of whiskey, and I offer him some. He shakes his head. When I come in the next day, I hear that Oliver has put in for a transfer. Me? I'm still here. After all... Somebody has to keep Hangman Hill's ghosts supplied with whiskey. I don't know exactly what I saw. It was all just one big blur. And the more I think about it, the more questions I end up with. It was a cold winter night. The ground had a decent amount of snow on it. At the time, I was one of those park cops, the kind that you would see on horses in the movies. Only I had a small vehicle. We didn't ride horses. I patrolled a wooded area near the East Coast, and a lot of times the worst we would come across were just some teens kissing, making out, things like that. That was usually our eventful night. 
busting kids for being too promiscuous. But the snow was out, and when the snow is out, the teens aren't as interested in being out. But I was doing my nightly due diligence, checking to make sure that the park was running properly, and that no one was lighting fires and things like that. Sometimes the homeless would set up a small spot where they could sit around a fire. I wish I could allow it. They deserve the warmth too, but we can't have anybody accidentally burning down trees or anything. So that's where I have to get involved. My first responsibility is human safety. After that, it's plant safety. That's what I like to think. Anyway, the snow wasn't falling anymore when this happened. It had stopped, and the snow on the ground was starting to freeze. It was a bit tough to move through, though, since the plows hadn't gone through the main roads yet. That meant the small roads weren't cleaned up at all, and it was just frigid. I have to admit, I was getting a little carsick from the bumpy ride. We weren't allowed to smoke in the park area, so I have this weird little area down by a waste management facility where I would go for a break. We have access to some of the dumpsters outside their enclosure, and the road and the little area that they are on isn't really owned by anybody. Sometimes we do find squatters hanging out there, but that night, it was empty. I was just taking my smoke break, catching my balance, you know, just taking it easy. It was weird how silent it was, like so quiet, but it was nice. I liked it. Then again, it was also kind of creepy. Anyway, I was smoking my cigarette and rubbing my hands together to try to get the blood moving when I heard some movement in the shrubs off to the side. It wasn't unusual, but it wigged me out a little because it had been so quiet. So I'm watching this bush. It wiggles a bit, but then it stops. Could have been a chipmunk or something, but it was pretty cold outside. Okay, I told myself, no biggie. I finished my cigarette, put it out, throw it in the dumpster, and get back in my vehicle. Then I start circling the area. Eventually, I come along a part of the road again, but a little further up towards some trees. Now this area is dimly lit. Like I said, sometimes squatters come and they use the area. It is a great place to hide out if that's what you're trying to do. But then I notice something very small and close to the ground. I didn't spot it at first. The snow was very white and this thing was very pale too. At first I thought it might have just been a plastic bag moving in the wind. But then I realized how round it was. It looked like a ball that you might play with in gym class. Just a plain, weird ball. Kind of like a tether ball. It was weird, though, because those balls are pretty hefty. But this thing was moving around in a way that wasn't like that. The wind couldn't be moving it. So I start to wonder if maybe somebody is moving the ball around and they're sitting under the tree. It's possible, but not likely. And that's when the thing moved more. Like... I watched it. I watched as this ball grew a torso and arms, and it kind of propped itself up. And now it no longer looked like a ball, it looked like a large round head on this tiny frail body. It was creepy as all get out, but I thought maybe it could be a kid? Baby left in the snow? So I stop my car and I get out. I move slowly towards the tree, and when I went to look for this kid, it wasn't there. It disappeared. But the weird thing was that the spot where it had been standing had been disturbed. So something was sitting in that spot, but was now gone. The other weird thing was that there weren't any footsteps around. I couldn't have followed its trail. So it pretty much just, poof, went away into thin air. I walked around for some time, and I radioed my supervisor. I started a whole search team for this endangered kid. I really thought somebody was in danger, but we never found them. And after that, I kind of lost my credibility. I was honest, though. I told them that I saw this weird, possibly malnourished small child in the snow. And when I went to help this child, it had disappeared. I guess I can see why nobody believed me, but I didn't think that I would be labeled as crazy. I'd been a good deputy, and I had always had the best intentions of the park and everybody in it. I know I'm not crazy. I'm not. I saw something that night. And I'm not really sure what I saw, but I know it was something that, to me, looked like it needed help. I'll help anybody. Really, anybody. It was freaky looking, but it looked cold and kind of sick, too. 
I'm still kind of worried about that thing that I saw. What if it was a kid, but now it's gone because I didn't save it? It crosses my mind from time to time, even though there are no missing children in the area. But I remind myself that I did what I could. I looked for it. My intention was good. It really was. I shouldn't be alive to write this story. I don't know if it was pure luck or some greater being was looking out for me, but two nights ago, I almost lost my life to something. I'm an amateur bird watcher, and Long Island, where I live, has a surprising number of different species to observe. I've spent a lot of time in the few county and state parks in the area, and I have a large catalog of hundreds of specimens that I've photographed. My white whale, if you will, is a snowy owl. They typically live in the northern reaches of Canada, but during the winter they migrate south, and a few make it to the shores of Long Island. I've been trying for several years to even catch a glimpse of one, but always to no avail. Still this past weekend, I gathered together my gear and I planned on exploring a stretch of open beach that I had rarely been to. It was out east, and that part of Long Island is much less populated. I have a mid-tier camera that I use, as well as a cheap pair of binoculars. I can't afford much more. So I got to the beach around 9 a.m., and of course it was completely abandoned. Only weirdos like me, who like birds, visit the beach in the winter, I guess. I walked for about two miles along the beach. Despite not catching sight of my quarry, I was enjoying myself. The cold air and the sense of isolation were actually invigorating. About 30 minutes away from my car, I decided to take a little rest and just look out over the ocean. I climbed to the top of one of the higher dunes and I sat down to take a seat. It had only been a few minutes when I saw something odd in the water. I was about 100 yards from the shoreline and this thing was probably another 100 yards out into the water, so I couldn't really get a good look at it. Whatever it was, it had a long, thin, white body, a stark contrast to the murky blue water that it was swimming in. And again, the distance made it difficult, but I guessed that it was 30 or 40 feet long. Its color ruled out a downed tree, and anyway, it was propelling itself through the water, not floating along with the current. The thought crossed my mind that it could be a sturgeon, but it appeared much larger than even the largest known sturgeons ever caught. I snapped a few pictures, but it was so far and the sun was so bright that you wouldn't even be able to make it out in the photos. I decided to head down towards the water to see if I could get a better look, and that turned out to be an awful idea. I lost sight of the creature as I climbed down the dune. The higher elevations had given me a better vantage point, and down here on the sand, I was level with the water. As I made my way across the beach heading towards the water, I stopped to try to clean the lens on my camera. Standing still, I could hear an odd sputtering over top the gentle lapping of the waves. I looked up, and heading straight towards me was the white, thin line of the creature, cutting atop the surface of the water like a shark's fin. Watching this thing moving through the water like an arrow was a totally surreal experience, and I stood transfixed, but I quickly snapped out of it as it hit the shoreline and emerged from the water. This thing had the head of a snake attached to a long, bony-looking body. The sun glinted off its stark white body as it flashed across the top of the sand. I turned and I ran as fast as I could, but beating through the sand that was dry was an exercise in futility. The thing was moving at twice the speed I could move, and I probably only had another 10 seconds before it was up on me. In a complete panic and not knowing what else to do, I ripped my camera from around my neck and I threw it as hard as possible at the creature. Now, I've never played baseball, and I was hardly athletic, but something was guiding my throw that day, and the heavy camera slammed right against the creature's face. It reared up its head and began violently shaking it back and forth, while the last ten-foot segment of the creature whipped back and forth across the sand, spraying a gritty cloud into the air all around. I took that opportunity to finish my dash up the dune, and I ran down to the road after climbing over it. I made steady progress down the road, and I kept throwing looks over my shoulder. Sure enough, the creature had regained its composure and came bursting over the top of the dune, onto the road behind me. It was moving even faster atop the cold pavement and gaining quickly. 
I had no camera to throw this time, and I was sure that I only had a few minutes to live. But the thing that happened next is what truly made me reconsider my agnostic beliefs in a higher power. Hooting like a barking fish, a flash of white erupted from a nearby clump of bushes. A thick body attached to a pair of thick flapping wings rocketed past and over me, right in the direction of the creature. A snowy owl, the same creature that I had set out to observe. Looking over my shoulder while running, the snake-like creature caught sight of the owl and stretched its long body out, snatching the poor owl from mid-flight. I tripped in surprise and sprawled on the ground. I watched as the snake thing, owl in its mouth, slammed its head into the pavement. The owl stopped its frantic flapping and lay still, and then with a slowness that the creature hadn't yet exhibited, it turned its long body and began to deliberately slither up and over the dune. I didn't go to investigate. I instead picked myself up and I finished the run back to my car. I beat it out of there quickly and I didn't catch sight of that thing again. I know this sounds made up. Even I struggle to believe that it happened. I don't know if that thing was some kind of undiscovered sea snake or something else equally as unnatural. What I do know is that I'll be going to church this Sunday and probably everyone after. This next story confirms that there is no shortage of strange stories coming out of West Virginia. This one takes place in April of 2017. I was born and raised in the small county of Greenbrier, West Virginia. It's a beautiful place nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. My family has lived in this area for generations, and I'm proud to have my roots here. I grew up exploring all the forests and streams and hunting and fishing with my dad. It's a simple life, but it's one that I cherish. Unfortunately, though, I've been offered a job transfer to another state, and even though I'm reluctant to leave, I know it's a good opportunity. I'm heading to Roanoke, Virginia, just a few hours' drive south. But since I have such deep roots and great memories here, one thing I really wanted to do before leaving was I wanted to go hiking one last time at Beartown State Park to soak up the beauty of the local wilderness. Beartown is known for its unusual rocky formations, massive boulders overhanging cliffs and deep crevices. Basically, it looks like a surreal landscape and you can really get lost in the massive rock formations. So that's why I found myself on a Saturday morning in early April, setting out to walk Beartown. The day was chilly, but sunny. I had packed a lunch to eat at the top of one of the rocks. I figured I would spend the whole day there, walking around and just reflecting on the area. But about an hour into the hike, things started to feel off. I began to feel like I was being watched and not by the usual suspects like deer or squirrels but by something else. I had been here so many times I could never count them all, but something about this feeling was very different. I tried to shake it off, but it persisted. I started to wonder if I was really just more nervous about moving than I had thought, but as I was pondering that, I heard something following behind me. It sounded like heavy footsteps, crunching leaves, crunching with each step on the ground. But every time I turned around, there was nothing there. I began to walk faster, but the footsteps kept pace with me. And then I heard something else, a deep, guttural, growling sound. And it was definitely coming from behind me, from whatever was following me. I turned around again, but still saw nothing. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move, something big and hairy and it was dodging in and out of the trees and the rocks, staying just out of sight, but definitely following me. I started to run, but it was no use. Whatever was following me was faster than I could ever be. And then before I knew it, I could feel it closing in on me, which is not a feeling I can describe adequately enough to get you to know and understand how that felt. This time when I turned around, I could see it. It was a large, furry creature with yellow eyes. It looked like a cross between a bear and a dog, and it was walking on two legs. I was 
paralyzed. I had never seen anything like this before. I didn't even dream things like this could exist. And then in my head, I heard it. I swear I heard these words. You're trespassing on my territory. It came in like a low, deep growl. You need to leave now, is what I heard. And it was definitely coming after me. I turned and I ran as fast as I could, but it was still right behind me. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck. And then just as it was about to catch up to me, I swung around with my backpack out in front of my outstretched arms. I was swinging it, swinging it like I was holding a baseball bat. I don't know how I had the courage to do it, but I managed to connect with its head, which stopped it for just a split second. I'm sure I just surprised it, but at least it gave me those few seconds of time. I turned, and I ran the other way as fast as I could. But this time, I literally didn't look back until I was out of the woods and back to my car. I had been hoping to see other people when I got to the parking lot, but it was completely empty when I got there. I paused, and I looked back towards the woods, but there was no sign of the creature. Nothing at all. Not even moving in the trees. I climbed into my car and drove away, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I'm still not sure what that creature was. But ever since then, I have been convinced that there are things in this world that we don't know about. Things that we can't explain. And also, whatever that thing was, it definitely wasn't friendly. As if you couldn't have figured that out already. I've thought about it a lot, but I still don't know what that creature was. I can only think that it was some kind of Sasquatch or Yeti type creature, maybe even a werewolf. But whatever it was, I'm just glad I made it out alive. It's honestly all I care about. I mean, what would you do if you were in my situation? Have you ever experienced anything like this? Please let me know. I would love to hear your story. I got to work late the night that this happened, or actually, it's more accurate to say very early that morning. I get in an hour before everyone else, and it was 5 a.m. on a cold February day in 2017 in Burlington County, New Jersey. When it's late and quiet like that, the parking lot seems like a ghost town. But of course, it's not really abandoned. There are still a few cars here and there but other employees really don't start coming in until 6 in the morning. Anyway, this early morning shift usually goes by quickly, but the last few nights hadn't passed fast enough. It had nothing to do with how busy we've been, but more due to all the strange things that have been happening around the shop lately. Things missing and windows broken. But we work in a warehouse that gets deliveries all night long, so it's important that someone's there, which means I couldn't call off. Because of all the oddities happening, some of my co-workers even begged me not to come alone. But it's hard to find anyone else willing to work that shift. So there I was, alone again that night, and all their talk honestly had me scared and wondering what fresh hell might await me beyond the big metal doors to the delivery area. It was probably my own paranoia acting up again and all the speculation stories because there's really no proof of anything really bad happening. Besides a few broken windows, that could be blamed on any number of things, like kids or drunks. Well, then there also was those missing tools, but they never were reported because they're always gone. We're always ordering more, something that I think makes us look incompetent at work. I've always just thought that someone who works here might be stealing them. Anyway, that tingling sensation was coming down my back as I pulled into the parking lot. You know, the kind that hinders you from focusing on anything. I told myself that tonight will be different, though. Tonight will pass quickly because I'll stay busy and nothing will happen. Well, in the end, the night didn't pass any faster than normal. And luckily... Everything did seem normal, until the incident. Out of the corner of my eye, while on the forklift sorting supplies onto shelves, I saw something quickly pass by outside one of the broken windows. It was a fleeting movement, something huge and quick, 
which seemed like a strange combination. I stopped working and stared out the window. I stood there trying to see what was there when I noticed the same movement again, this time disappearing around the side of the building. It moved quickly, and it was higher than the window, so whatever it was must have been very tall, at least seven or eight feet. Its height was weird enough, but I swear I saw what looked like an arm hanging down too, dark colored, but I couldn't tell exactly because it was still so dark outside. Then soon after, I was sure I heard someone rattling the entry door, so naturally I panicked and I drove the forklift as fast as I could towards the large open space where I didn't feel so vulnerable. I wanted to get away from those windows, just in case. But I also knew the noise of the machine would alert whoever it was, not only that I was in the building, but now they would know exactly where I was. I was really freaking out now, but telling myself it was probably just the same person who steals the tools. Weird to think that a thief was actually my best case scenario at this point. I waited for a while to see if there was any further movement or sound, but when no one came into the building I realized it must have been one of my co-workers parking and entering the front door, the door I couldn't see from the warehouse. So sure enough, before long, my co-worker John walked into delivery from the front office. He looked barely awake and seemed to be heading to the break room for a cup of coffee. I tried to play cool and I asked if he needed any help with anything, but he said nothing and walked right by me like usual, not even looking up or saying hello. Odd, but honestly not that unusual for him. I was just happy that someone else had actually showed up and I wasn't there alone anymore. Well, we both got to work, with me continuing to sort supplies and him doing his usual straightening up the delivery area. Just like before, I kept finding myself staring out the broken windows, trying to catch another glimpse of whatever it was that I saw, or thought I saw. It had to be nothing, right? It had to be my imagination getting the best of me. There's definitely no weird creature like that out there, I kept telling myself. After a few hours, I went to the bathroom, and when I came back, John was gone. I wasn't entirely sure where he had gone. He usually tells me, and the rules are for one person to always be on the floor, so I was a little freaked out that he was nowhere in sight. I called his name out a few times in case he was on the far side of the building, but no answer. Anyway, I kept it together, and I kept sorting supplies until I heard the door open again. It was John standing in the back doorway, but then he ran right back outside. The look on his face told me instantly that something was wrong. He was clearly in a panic. This wasn't the same calm, cool John that I usually saw every day at work. He called out to me, sounding desperate for help, something about dogs and a creature outside the building. My heart skipped a beat when he said the word dog. I lost it. I instantly followed him outside, but I didn't see anything. Nothing was different from before, and it seemed like nothing was out there. But John kept calling for my help, and he sounded like he needed it badly. Like when you think someone has been attacked, or when they're in some kind of big trouble, like drowning or something. I didn't know what to think, but John sounded in serious trouble, so I ran out into the parking lot to help him. John was screaming about a dog thing, and that he needed help. He was staring off into the woods with the building behind him as if he thought something was out there. But boy was he wrong. It wasn't out there. From where I stood, I was between John and the building. I could see that this dog creature was 20 steps behind him and walking towards him. Neither of them was looking back at me and I'm not convinced they even knew I was there yet. From behind, the creature looked more dog-like than man in terms of the matted fur, but the thing was walking towards John on two legs, which was something my brain wasn't computing. And then the dog creature stopped and turned to look at me. It seemed to notice me, and then it did something that still makes my blood turn cold when I think about it. It opened its mouth and barked at me. Only it wasn't really a bark, it was screaming at me with a sound that I will never forget. It stared me straight in the eyes and snapped its mouth shut, gritting its fangs and then growling a low, guttural growl, something that seemed to rumble the earth. We stood there, in a standstill, me staring at it, it staring at me. Was it waiting for me to make a move? Who knows? 
I wasn't even able to do anything but stand there watching it anyway. And then it spun around and it ran. It ran past John without even pausing as it passed him, and it headed to the woods on the other side of the parking lot, the far side. It was like my brain couldn't process what was going on. It made no sense at all. All I could do was watch it run away. John was somehow more lucid than I was after the whole thing. I was confused. Why didn't it attack me? Or attack him? But John wasn't in a state of mind to care about that. He didn't need to know why. He was just happy that it didn't happen. He kept reassuring me that it would be okay, telling me that it's gone now and we were safe now. It was a total 180. He was taking care of me. I wanted to believe him, but it didn't make sense why it ran away like that. From what I was seeing, it totally had the advantage. There wasn't any good explanation for its retreat. It basically came down to my wondering if it just didn't want to kill us or if it was scared of something, something we didn't know about or couldn't see. Maybe it just got caught up in the whole situation and didn't even mean to be there. Now, all I can do is wonder if this creature, or its tribe if that exists, has anything to do with our broken windows and missing tools. The thought of an armed and dangerous group of dog creatures near the shop is enough to keep me up at night, and away from the night shift. Yes, that's true. I finally listened to my co-workers and stopped working the night shift. However, I never told them exactly why. John and I made a pact that we would never tell a soul about what happened to us. We're both afraid that they'll think we're crazy. So now it's been weeks, and the thing hasn't shown up again. I think it moved on, or it's just waiting for the next best opportunity. Interestingly, no more tools have disappeared either. I've also done a bit of research online, and it seems like dogman encounter stories are pretty common among the locals here. But you never seem to hear anyone mention them in person. And I've only seen anonymous postings online. It seems like people who encounter these things are really affected by the encounter. Just like me. John, too. He and I don't really run into each other much, so I have no one to talk about it with. I've seriously thought about seeing a shrink, but I'm worried that they'll commit me. I don't even know if they're allowed to do that or if they have to keep our discussions private. I'm actually too scared to find out, but something is going to have to change. Soon. Hey Lilith, I've listened to your channel for a while now, and I've met most of your stories with a mix of skepticism and awe. It's hard to believe that so many mystical creatures and beings exist in the world, and I thought that maybe some people were exaggerating or even straight up lying. Well, I no longer believe that. After hearing so many stories, I felt inspired to try to hunt down one of these things myself. I grew up in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, which is right on the border of Pennsylvania and Delaware. There's a state park close by. Brandywine State Park, where the famous battle was fought. A small part of that park is known as Beaver Valley. From satanic cults to a town full of little people, the number of conspiracies surrounding the place can lead you down quite a rabbit hole. I've been there in the daytime once or twice. Some people used it as a shortcut when Naaman's Road was backed up, but never at night and never on any of the roads that supposedly harbored evil spirits. Well, one night after getting out of work around 11 o'clock, but feeling adventurous, I called my friend Alan to see if he wanted to check the place out with me. He agreed, and within a half hour I had picked him up and we were on our way. The park itself is pretty big and there are multiple roads leading into and out of it. Navigating it can be a little confusing and cell phone service stinks down there, so GPS apps don't always work. Alan said he knew his way around, but I didn't really believe him. It didn't matter. I didn't have anything else to do this late at night anyway. So driving through the outskirts of the park was a little creepy. A few people live back in there, but there's no streetlights at all. The only illumination we had was being cast by my car's headlights. The roads rose and fell and curved often, sometimes sharply, so I had to give driving my full attention. 
Eventually, we found what we were looking for, Satan's Road, so called because of the way that the trees grow along the road. They all curve away from the road as if they're trying to uproot and escape something that's coming from deeper within the forest. I've heard about it plenty of times, but actually seeing it? Well, that's a very different experience. There are rumors of cults practicing satanic rituals here in the wood. Recalling the rumors and seeing the trees, I was starting to feel like I had my fill of weirdness for the night. I was thinking about getting through as fast as I could and getting back out onto one of the larger roads when Alan gave a surprised yelp from the passenger seat. He told me that he was looking in the forest beside the car and he had seen something running along before disappearing into the brush. He didn't know what it was, but he said it could have been a deer or something. There's a lot of them back there. I hoped so, and I kept driving. I figured out we were three quarters of the way through when I rounded another sharp curve and I had to slam on my brakes. I had almost hit it. Right in front of the car, about ten feet away, shining in the headlights, stood a completely naked man. Now it was January and the temperatures have been dropping into the 30s lately, so the guy should have been freezing. A tall, thin man, filthy with long matted brown hair and an unkempt beard, stood staring into the windshield, not shivering or showing any signs of being exposed to the cold. And his breath wasn't even fogging. Alan and I sat silently, both too shocked to say anything, and honestly, I was extremely scared. It started to get colder, and even inside the car I started to shiver, and then a moment later was shivering uncontrollably. Alan was doing the same right next to me. I began coming around to what was happening, and I reached down to put the car in reverse. Something was telling me to just get the hell out of there and leave the naked guy standing in the road, but the car would not move. I was pressing the gas, and the engine wouldn't even rev. I wasn't even sure that the car was on anymore. Now my head was beginning to feel foggy. Thoughts and ideas kept forming in my head, but they were slipping away before they could take root. I vaguely remember Alan next to me reciting something that sounded like a Bible verse. As far as I know, Alan isn't particularly religious, and I found it strange that he could quote passages from the Bible. And then the man started to move, slowly stepping backward, methodically, foot after foot, still staring right into the windshield at me and Alan. The man backed away, completely out of view of the headlights, and then all that was in front of us was a stretch of empty road. I started warming up immediately, and the fogginess began drifting away. And then I saw the eyes. Ahead on the road coming from where the man had disappeared was this pair of narrowed red orbs hovering about eight feet off the ground. They were moving slowly up and down as if attached to something moving. They were. The creature slowly appeared in view of the light. It had the shape and size of a horse, but the head, the head was a sick cross between a ram and a man. Curling horns jutted from both sides and wisps of dark fur, but the nose and the mouth were unmistakably human. The fogginess returned tenfold, and I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer. I woke up to banging on my window next to my head, and I had an excruciating headache, and there was a light being shined in my face. It was a police officer. In short, we had come to in a small clearing off the roundabout about three miles away from where we had been. Alan had passed out as well, and neither of us could recall anything. The police officer asked us a lot of questions and even searched the car for drugs and gave me a breathalyzer. We told him everything, and by the time we were done, he must have just thought we were some kind of weird loonies, and he just wanted to get rid of us. We hadn't really done anything illegal, at least I didn't think so, so he let us go. I don't know how we ended up in the clearing, and I don't remember what happened after, well, after we saw the thing. I mean, bits and pieces are coming back to me slowly. I'm trying to think of all kinds of excuses. Maybe something was up with my car and we got a non-lethal dose of carbon monoxide or something. I don't know. I can't explain it. Since that night, there are random moments where I feel a sense of overwhelming terror, like something horrible is only seconds away from happening. And for some reason, the date of August 17th 
2026 is constantly on my mind. I can't get it out of my head, and I have no idea why. Every cop has their share of crazy stories, but this one is definitely the highlight of my career. Back in the 80s, I was an officer in the Bridgeport Police Department. It's an industrial center on the coast of Connecticut. It's not a massive metroplex like Dallas or New York City, but it's big enough to have its share of crime. I worked in the North End, up toward the border with Trumbull in a residential area. Lots of duplexes and triplexes there, so there were more families than you would think based on the housing. The thing about being a neighborhood cop is that at least back then, we got to know the people. There was always somebody good to give you gossip and a lot of time. That kind of connection helps you keep the peace better than anything the force tells you to do nowadays. My favorite neighbor, actually she was everybody's favorite neighbor, was Mrs. Belinsky. She was a sweet elderly woman in her 80s who owned a triplex in the middle of the block. She didn't have family close by, so everybody looked out for her. Mrs. Belinsky baked the best cookies, which she always had ready for me on Tuesday when I stopped by. She would smile and chat, and I'd make sure she didn't need anything before I kept going on my patrol. Fortunately, she lived in a pretty quiet neighborhood, so there weren't many problems. Sure, there was the occasional drunk neighbor, especially on Saturday nights, or maybe there was a loud party every once in a while, but I never got a call to go to Mrs. Belinsky's place. Until the night I did. The call didn't come from her, it came from a neighbor. Like I said, everybody loved Mrs. Belinsky and made sure that they looked out for her. So when the neighbor lady heard loud arguing coming from the Belinsky house, she called the station. I hadn't clocked out yet, so I came over as fast as I could to do a welfare check. I went in the rattling gate and I knocked on the door. I knew it would take Mrs. Belinsky a while to get to the door, so I made sure I listened for any raised voices, since that's what the neighbor's complaint said. When Mrs. Belinsky finally got to the door, she was in her housecoat and carrying her little white poodle. She didn't seem to be in distress, but the dog looked a little agitated. Still, Mrs. Belinsky was surprised to see me. Apparently, she hadn't heard anything. She didn't have tenants at the moment, so she couldn't imagine why her neighbor would say she had heard yelling. Since she wasn't in danger and I couldn't hear anything, I asked if I could make a perimeter check of her property to make sure that everything was closed up tight. She didn't have a problem with that. So I walked around, tapping the windows to make sure none of them were loose and checking the door locks. The front of the house was fine, but the big backyard was overgrown in some spots, and that made me nervous. It was dark, and the yard had some bushes that would make great cover for anybody trying to sneak around. I didn't see any signs that anybody had been there, but there was something about the yard that just made my skin crawl. Still, I didn't see any intruders or sign of trespassers, so I had to report to Mrs. Belinsky that everything was fine. I told her to call if she heard anything, and then I left. Everything seemed to go back to normal. I checked in with the neighbor who had made the initial report, but she hadn't heard anything further. I asked casually if she had seen anything or anybody in the backyard. Turns out, her teenage son mowed Mrs. Belinsky's lawn for her, but he never said he saw anything. I chalked it up to a loud TV. I mean, Mrs. Belinsky was half deaf, and I considered the matter closed. Until the next Tuesday night when a different neighbor called the precinct to report what sounded like a man yelling at Mrs. Belinsky's house. I sped over there, lights and sirens, jerked open the gate and sprinted up the steps. As I pounded on the storm door, the yelling cut off like somebody had yanked the plug on it. The hair on the back of my neck was already standing up, and the feeling only got worse as I waited for Mrs. Belinsky to come to the door. When she didn't, well, you don't have to be a cop to realize what was going through my head. By now, some of the neighbors were standing around, hanging at the fence line. I pounded on the door one more time and announced that I was the police. Still, nothing. I could hear sirens in the distance and I knew backup was coming, but I didn't want to wait. Not with the life of one elderly lady potentially hanging in the balance. 
so I kicked open the door and I went in. I knew the layout of Mrs. Belinsky's first floor since I had been there. The front room parlor, where she had all of her best furniture, was empty. And then the doorway opposite me led to the dining room and then the kitchen. I knew she watched her shows in her little sitting room off of the dining room. If she was doing her usual thing and just hadn't heard me, I knew that that's where she would be. I was listening for any sounds, any sounds at all. But other than the sounds of the street outside, I didn't hear anything. I moved left, gun drawn, and I held low and ready, and I eased around the corner to peek into the sitting room. Mrs. B was in her rocking chair, either sleep or unconscious. She didn't appear to be injured, and there were no other signs of an intruder, but that didn't mean I relaxed. Her dog was missing. I holstered my service weapon and I tried to wake Mrs. Belinsky. To say she was surprised to see me was an understatement. Once I explained what had happened, I asked where the poodle was. She said she didn't know. That bad feeling had never really left, but now it came back with a vengeance. I got Mrs. B outside with the neighbors and I promised to look for her dog. I figured if the poodle wasn't with her owner, it probably wasn't on the first floor. So I went through the door that led to the second floor apartment. The layout up there was similar to Mrs. Belinsky's with a hallway leading to the third floor stair in the back. Mrs. Belinsky's apartment was homey and old fashioned. These untenanted floors were unsettling to say the least. Weird. The floors creaked under my weight, but the further into the space I went, the more muffled the sound seemed to be. It almost felt like I was underwater. Everything seemed to come to me slowly. Sound, thoughts, everything. The space was strange, but it was also empty. I headed for the stairway to the last apartment, and as soon as my shoe touched the steep painted stair, I heard yelling. I couldn't make out what was being said, but there was a very clear argument happening. Male and female voices. My training kicked in. I started up the stairs with my pulse pounding in my ears. I knew there were ten stairs. I knew because I counted them. But even though I knew that, I felt like I was climbing them forever. It was like the minutes were being stretched out like taffy by hands that I couldn't see, and for a reason that I didn't understand. Finally, I broke all my training, and I looked down at each step as I took it, mentally walking myself through the motions of picking up my foot, placing my foot on the next step. Now my foot is on this step. I'm moving up. I know it sounds utterly ridiculous now that I'm writing it, but at the time, it was the only way I could seem to get up there at all. And then I got to the third floor landing, and the door to the next apartment was right there. I could hear the argument again, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. It felt like I was hearing everything underwater. I'm ashamed to say this, but I actually broke out in goosebumps. I mean, I wasn't a rookie, and this wasn't my first domestic disturbance call, but I also knew that there shouldn't be anybody in that apartment to even have a disturbance. I took a deep breath, and I pounded on the door. Police! I don't have an explanation for what happened next, so I'll just report it. The landing got cold. Not, there was a breeze cold. Frigid so cold that I could see my breath puffing out, fast and uneven. The landing light came on even though I wasn't anywhere near the switch, and that somehow made the shadows at the edges of the landing even darker. At that point, all I wanted to do was to leave, but I couldn't make myself move. I have no idea what I would have done if I hadn't heard a whimper. I almost jumped out of my skin when something touched my leg. It was Mrs. Belinsky's little white dog shivering so hard that it looked like it was going to shake itself into pieces. I don't know what it was about the dog, but just having it there, knowing I needed to get it back to Mrs. B, who loved it, made me able to move. I scooped up the dog and I started hustling back down the stairs. I was terrified that it would take just as long to get down them as it had seemed to get up them, but I felt like I was able to move normally. I didn't breathe right until I got down to Mrs. Belinsky's floor. As soon as the poodle saw her, it squirmed out of my hold and trotted right over to her, who was sitting with a couple of neighbors. The cold feeling then vanished, 
and I was left feeling almost silly for being worried. Almost. I don't quite remember how I ended up filling out the incident report on that call, but I'm pretty sure I didn't mention cold spots, odd time distortions, and an argument from people who didn't exist. As for Mrs. Belinsky's noise problem, well, her neighbors talked her into having her parish priest come over, and I guess the blessing the house did the trick. Or at least, I was never called back there for that kind of a disturbance again. I'm looking to hear if any of your listeners are from the Appalachian Mountains. There's something out here that you have got to see to believe. I was walking through the woods with my boyfriend a few weeks ago, and he was doing that thing he does that I hate, which is walk so fast that I could barely keep up. Pet peeve of mine. Also, I was getting winded, and this was not what I was thinking when I had said I wanted us to go on a day hike. I was thinking a pleasant afternoon, kind of romantic, but he was turning it into a forced march, and I was getting frustrated. A few times I had to call out to him to wait up, and he just would stand there looking all impatient. Anyway, I was getting really ticked off, so I decided just to teach him a lesson. The trail was winding around, and he was getting further and further ahead of me, And when it rounded a corner, he just disappeared from sight, like he didn't even care that he was so far off in front. So I just thought, to hell with him, I'll give him some reason to worry, and then maybe he won't do it again. So I went off trail. Now, I'm not stupid, I know you can get lost easily, but I was irritated and I was wanting to prove a point. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm keeping my ears peeled, thinking I'll hear him start calling my name any minute. I walked for like 10 minutes, trying not to go too far from the trail. I just kind of walked parallel to it. Also, as I'm writing this, I'm seeing this whole thing in a new light, and boy, do I sound dumb. Like one of those girls in a horror movie who you know is going to get targeted by the killer. So then I had to stop and pee, so I went behind a big tree, even though I wasn't visible to the trail, but habit, I guess. While I was squatting there, I heard this rustling up above me, and at first I thought it was just squirrels or something, but then I had this weird feeling like somebody was watching me. It freaked me out, especially because I was in this vulnerable position, and so I quickly got my pants pulled up and I started walking again, and I kept looking behind me, thinking somebody was following me. Just a weird feeling, but my body must have known something because the hair on my arms was standing up. At first I told myself I had imagined it, and then I started wondering if it was just my boyfriend and that maybe he was going to jump out at me and teach me a lesson. I hate that, by the way, when somebody scares you for a laugh. I stopped at one point and I talked into the woods behind me saying, Okay, Brian, I hear you. And then I waited, but he didn't come out. The longer I looked at the woods behind me, the more uneasy I was getting. So I started walking again. I was really disappointed that I wasn't hearing Brian yelling my name. I mean, did he not even notice that I was gone? Or did he just not care? My brain was taking me in all the directions. I then stopped to listen again, thinking he had gotten far away when I heard this noise above me. A crackling of branches and leaves swishing. That kind of a sound. I got a little nervous because it sounded too big to be squirrels or anything else that you would normally find in a tree. It sounded big, and I had just decided to turn around and start reversing my path back to the main trail when I heard a cough, a human cough, no mistaking it, but it came from above. I looked up into the branches of this big oak tree, one of those ancient ones, and at first I didn't see anything, but all of a sudden I saw movement, and I saw him, at least parts of him. It was a man, but he looked odd, like really hairy. Now, I'm not talking about Bigfoot kind of hairy. This was just a really hairy guy with an overgrown beard and long, shaggy hair. The skin on his face looked similar to a dark tan, I guess, with facial hair covering most of it. It was the fact that he was up in a tree, way off the trail watching me, that completely freaked me out. I looked up at him and I yelled, stay away. I was thinking that this was the creep that had watched me pee a few minutes ago when I heard that noise. But that didn't really make sense because that incident had happened about 20 yards back. And I don't think people can move from tree to tree like monkeys like that. 
Right after I yelled, the guy jumped down to a lower limb like he was coming for me. His eyes were focused on me, and he didn't even need to be careful or look around as he came down. No, all eyes were on me. I lost my cool and I just ran like hell back in the direction that I had come. I was frantic, trying to run as fast as I could, but I had to swerve quickly a few times when I realized that I had taken the wrong way. Next, I heard a thud behind me, and I started praying, but a second later, the guy grabbed me from behind, one arm in a headlock and his other arm around my shoulders and chest. I started screaming my head off, and I grabbed at his arm, scratching and trying to pull him off of me. His arm was weird looking, and that frightened me even more, even more than I had already been. He was super muscular, and he had this really dry skin on his hands, but it was all wrinkled like a raisin. His arm was hairy all the way down to his wrist, too. I didn't turn around to see his face, but I have to tell you, he had the worst smell of any living creature that I have ever experienced. I'm screaming my head off, and he's trying to drag me over to a tree, and... He's winning. Suddenly, I hear my boyfriend. Thank God. He was calling my name frantically. He sounded pretty close, but he couldn't see me. And that's when the hairy man let me go. I yelled, Here! And I swung around, trying to see where Brian was. I then watched as the man just leapt up into the tree, almost running straight up the trunk. It was supernatural, almost. Super fast. Looking like he did it all the time but I wasted no time running towards Brian's voice and I didn't stick around to see where the guy went. Brian was there in a clearing and I ran straight into his arms, shaking like crazy. I blubbered out my whole story and he held me. I was shaking so hard. Once he understood what I was telling him, he got all tense, looked around like he wanted to find that guy. But I begged him for us to just leave and he finally said okay, but he made us stop at the local police department to report it. They acted like I was a wacko when I told them that the guy was in the trees out there. But they took my report, and then we just went home. Okay, so all of you out there, what the hell was this thing? I'm telling you, it was not a creature like Bigfoot. It was definitely a man, but a man who climbed the trees like a monkey. Command told me it was a training accident, but I'm not so sure. Something weird happened during our final field training exercise. I mean, really weird. Not just the usual, did I see what I thought I saw because I've been sleep deprived for 15 weeks kind of weird. I'm an army combat medic, which means that after completing basic training, I opted to train more so that I could become a medical specialist. Combat medic training is four straight months of 16 to 20 hour days, constantly working, learning how to save the lives of my battle buddies and not how to become a casualty myself. I'd made it through to the final, which put me at Joint Base San Antonio for the field training exercise. It's basically the eight-day final exam from hell, where we go through everything we might be expected to come across while we're on duty. My squad was doing the dismounted patrol, which is exactly what it sounds like. Soldiers walking patrol, ready for action. It was hard. It's meant to be hard. But when I was in the middle of it, all I could focus on was making it through. We were walking our route, moving single file through heavy brush. Not a lot of visibility, plenty of things that crunch underfoot while you walk. It was basically a live training sim. We had weapons, but no real ammunition, our full kit, and we had standard combat objectives to accomplish. We all knew that at some point we would find another patrol. One of the situations we had to deal with was finding casualties, which we would have to assess, treat, and medevac. It wasn't anything we hadn't been through already, we'd all just been through basic training. We were all stressed beyond belief, but we were soldiers, we were medics, and we were all determined to make it through this together. We'd been walking the patrol route for a while when we found the ambush. Soldiers were lying scattered around a clearing, some in cover and some in the open, Some of them were groaning in pain. Others weren't making any noise. TV medics will rush forward to help the wounded before securing the area. Combat medics aren't that dumb. We deployed to secure the area, and that's when the bad guys showed back up. Knowing that the bad guys were actually our own instructors, 
it didn't make it feel any less stressful. At that point, I'm pretty sure seeing a fluffy bunny would have sent me, at least, into overdrive. Our squad took casualties as we suppressed the threat, which gave us additional patients. We started triage, followed the protocol for assessing which patients could be treated first or had to be treated first. Soldiers with small cuts weren't a priority. The patient who took a round to the leg and was bleeding from a femoral artery was. So nothing I've described so far was weird. It was all what we had been led to understand would be happening. Dismounted patrol, find wounded, care for them, achieve the tactical objective while dealing with casualties. But this was where it got strange. My partner and I were working on our patient who had a simulated gunshot wound to the thoracic cavity. We were working through the MARCH protocol. We all knew it in our sleep at this point. Massive hemorrhage, airway, respiration, circulation, hypothermia. We were behind some heavy cover while the security detail did their job and kept us clear from bad guys. We were shouting to each other, trying to get our patients to talk to us. Maybe that's why we didn't hear anything. Someone shouted, and we froze. It was like a yell like we had never heard before. I'd heard soldiers who got wounded during basic. Accidents happen, but this sounded different. My partner and I looked at each other as we worked on our patient. I could see the look on his face. We worked on autopilot to stabilize our wounded, but I think we were both wondering the same thing. Was there a second wounded patrol we were supposed to find? When we finished, we filled out the patient's paperwork, tagged it on his belt, and got ready for evacuation. That's when Staff Sergeant Meadows came running over. He told us to form up and come with him. When your sergeant tells you to do something, you do it. My partner and I handed over our patient and we grabbed our rifles and we followed him into the brush at a run. We saw the bushes before we saw the body, but Staff Sergeant Meadows skidded to a halt and motioned for us to hold while he secured the area. That's when I noticed that his rifle didn't have an orange painted dummy clip. He had live ammunition. At that point, I knew something was wrong. But like I said, I was in combat medic mode and I was following protocol because that's what you do to stay alive. I waited until Staff Sergeant waved us forward and once he did, my battle buddy and I darted forward to the casualty. Actually seeing someone wounded is beyond stressful. I knew I'd been training for this. I knew this was what I wanted, but it felt so different. This was a real patient, with real injuries. We could smell the blood when we rolled the body over. We did everything we were trained to do. Snapped on gloves, did the blood sweep, tried to get the soldier to talk so we'd know if his airway was compromised. I didn't think it was because the claw marks on his face didn't reach his throat. But you still have to check, because things can change ridiculously fast, especially in the field. Besides the face, there were defensive wounds on his forearms thorax seemed okay, and we didn't need to intubate. I was in the kind of haze where I knew exactly what to do, exactly what to use to help. My partner and I had been working together so much that we moved like one unit. Assess, triage, treat, tourniquet the arm, pack the gashes with hemostatic material. What did this to him? It was a question I didn't really ask myself until later. Plenty of stuff had claws out there. Mountain lions? I didn't think there were wolves or bears, but that didn't mean something hadn't wandered through. You don't focus on speculation, though. But it wasn't a speculation making the dry brush on the ground crack. There was something out there. Sergeant's rifle was immediately pointed in the direction of the sound. He motioned for us to finish, fast. There was no way a single security point could hold this position safely, even if we were under cover while we worked. Bushes are great for concealing not for providing anything that will stop a bullet. We were good. We were fast. We started packing the wounded onto a stretcher, and I finally realized that he was one of our other instructors. What had he been doing out here alone? Sergeant yelled for us to get down, and something erupted from the bushes. I say something because I only saw a gray and tan blur before I was on my face in the dirt, covering my patient and clutching my useless rifle. Sergeant screamed, There was a sound like, I don't know, ripping fabric? That sound that a knife makes when it's cutting through raw steak? Then there was an incredible smell of blood, too thick to just be from new wounds. It smelled old, and there was this awful stink of urine. 
I could have explained all of that away, but I could not explain the growl. It was low, deep, high up. Whatever this thing was, it was not a mountain lion. The dry ground crunched under its weight as it turned, and the growling sounded like it was pointed in our direction. I was not ashamed to admit that I started praying. My battle buddy was doing a little more than that. He'd been fiddling with his two-way radio, and he set it to make that horrible ultrasonic screech that electronics make when you've royally screwed them up. That noise felt like someone took an ice pick to my temple. I can't imagine how that thing felt, but it wasn't good. It yelped and it whined and it almost sounded like a dog, and then the stink was gone. My buddy kept the noise going while we scrambled over to Sergeant Meadows. We went into medic mode again, going through the protocol. He had gashes to the chest and had been thrown across the clearing. Very different treatment. We did our best. I won't go through the details of the medevac. Both Sarge and our other patients survived. Our class all passed the test, and my battle buddy and I got the highest marks. But nobody, including our two wounded, talked about what happened. The official statement was that cougars had been sighted on base, and that one had attacked an instructor who'd been setting up for our class's dismounted patrol. I know I was functioning on adrenaline and sleep deprivation, but I know that whatever we encountered was no cougar. What it was is something I'm less sure of. And whether it's still out there, that I'm even less sure of. Some cities and states get all the attention. Something strange happens in New York or Florida, and it's viral on social media within the hour. Strange things happen in the Ozarks, though, and nobody seems to care. I live in Benton County, Arkansas. Plenty of strange things have happened here, but only one strange thing has happened to me. That's what I want to talk about. I should confess something up front, I guess. I like the strange. When I hear something odd or unexplainable has happened, I run in that direction. I like the mystery, I think. I always wanted to feel like I was a part of something special, and special somethings didn't come often, though, to Benton County. Until 2016, that is. Two years prior, someone reportedly saw a strange creature wandering through the edge of the Ozark National Forest. It became my fixation. No one could prove that the man hadn't seen what he claimed, and I wanted to see it too. I made myself like hiking. I went out every day that I could, and I walked the longest and the least popular trails. I just wanted to catch a glimpse of that thing. I wanted to be a part of that story. I was an idiot. A few people took notice of my repeat visits. National Park Service, I guess. I don't blame them for keeping an eye on me. I do blame them for what ended up happening, though. They made me the latest in a long list of Benton County idiots. As I was saying, it was 2016 and I was on one of my usual hikes. I didn't notice anyone following me that day. I thought the rangers had gotten bored by then. I spotted something on the trail ahead of me. A small, gray, furry shape that didn't immediately resemble a fox or a rabbit. I was worried that it might be a little mountain lion cub. I've seen mother lions chase people off the trails, and I didn't want that to be the story I ended up with. But what if the cub wasn't a lion, I thought? What if it was actually the creature that I was looking for? I moved closer. When my feet shifted on the ground, the small animal saw me. It turned and it pointed its flat, feline nose in my direction. Right away, I saw the two horn-like stumps growing from the top of its head. The little thing opened its mouth and made a pitiful mewing sound, sort of like a baby whining after a long nap. It made me smile. It wasn't what I'd been looking for, but it was certainly interesting and weird, too. And then something screamed from the tree line to my left. It screamed how a human woman might scream how a human woman might scream if she was afraid for her life. I felt every bone in my body grow cold right that very moment. When I turned to look, I could only vaguely decipher the shape of the mother creature from its place in the shadows of the Ozarks. It looked like a big cat. Maybe a lion wasn't so far off. Its face was flat, and two antlers protruded from its head. Its tail looked naked too, maybe like a rat's. 
Maybe it had mange. I wasn't sure then, and I'm not sure now. All I'm sure is that when the beast opened its mouth, it cried in a way that only people should cry. It shrieked at me. It shrilled as it urged me away. I should have ran. I'd gone looking for this thing, right? And I know running is the last thing you want to do when you're caught by a mother defending her young. But I ran anyway, fighting or freezing or backing away slowly. None of that even occurred to me. I ran and I could hear it run behind me. It screamed while it chased me. It screamed so loud that I thought my ears might bleed. There was no telling how close it was either, not with a scream like that. Suddenly I wasn't alone on the trail. I was running past two park rangers. There were more following behind them. I kept running. Only after half a dozen rangers passed by me did I even consider that the monster was no longer behind me. The three gunshots that erupted behind me forced me to hit the ground. I landed on my knees and my hands. I felt like my heart and lungs were exploding. When they didn't, I looked up. Some of the rangers were already running back down the trail, shaking their heads and complaining about the run. I asked in disbelief, hadn't they seen it? No, they said. There was nothing there besides my screaming, they told me. Why was the gun fired, I asked. What gun? Even the ranger who emerged from the top of the trail with scuffs on his palms to his elbows insisted that they had not seen anything in the woods. They didn't see or hear anything chasing me down that trail. I had never been so mad. When I got back to town, I told anyone who would listen. I told them what I had seen and how the park service had reacted. The park service, of course, spun a yarn to make me look like the imbecile. They told my friends that I was found dehydrated in the woods, that I had been drinking, and I got turned around. The sun had scrambled my head, made me hallucinate. What choice did my friends have except to believe them? They all knew how desperate I was to be a part of a strange adventure. It didn't seem unreasonable to think that my mind invented a story when my body couldn't find one. But I know the truth. I know what I saw and what they saw and what they had to do in order to protect themselves. I know there's something deadly in the Ozarks. Next time, I'm going to take its picture. <laughs>